Murray Rothbard, who of course was a historian as well as an economist, used to dream of the day that there might someday, someplace, be an historian who understood Austrian economics. And uh, I must say he wasn't, he was optimistic about everything he hoped for it, but uh, it's so great that he got to meet and to know Tom Woods uh, before he passed away. I remember when Tom first came as a student to Mises University in 1993, and at the closing barbecue, he had wanted to meet Murray, and I wanted, Murray wanted to meet him. Um, so I noticed them talking together, and I come back maybe two hours later, and they're still right like this, just, you know, talking away. And it was, it was uh, I thought, very moving to see it. I know it was a great experience for Tom, and it was a great experience for Murray, too. So uh, you know Tom Woods. He, he is a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. He's the author of 11 books, including two bestsellers. Uh, on his way to the proverbial five-foot uh, shelf of books, I guess Tom, as they used to say, in the 19th century for the scholar would aim at. Uh, he uh, graduated summa cum laude from Harvard. Um, he got his MPhil and his PhD from Columbia University. Uh, he has a wonderful and innovative website, uh, tomwoods.com, and also Liberty Classroom. And uh, appropriately enough, Tom is going to talk to us tonight uh, about Murray Rothbard. So, Dr. Tom Woods. Okay, Hi. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. I am christening this thing. This has never been used. In fact, how about this? Just to indicate, there's no egalitarianism here. Okay. There's no no free access to back here. Yeah, it's closed. All right. Now, by the way, I'm not I'm not reading off this, but there are points I want to make uh, when I do talk about uh, Murray Rothbard. That if I forgot to make them, I would be very sad. So they're just there to remind me. But anyway, I have been working on the speech all day, and. Of course, I don't mean this speech. I mean the victory speech I'm going to give after I beat Walter in chess <laughs> um, Now, incidentally, just so you know how this got started, uh, last year we had a chess tournament at the Mises Institute because we had a bunch of grad students who were interested in chess, and it was six Europeans and me. And like all Americans, I have an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis Europeans, so I... Being in the tournament, I thought, you know, well, I have no business even being in the same room with these people, right? Of course, I'm going to get slaughtered. And the first game of the tournament, I lost. So I thought, oh, it just goes to show. What am I doing? I'm not even in the same league with these people. And then I won all the others, and I ended up winning the whole tournament. So I actually, I actually walked around. I don't know if Lou knew this, but I actually went around the Institute going, USA. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway... We decided for some reason, because we knew Walter was a, a good chess player, that, that uh, whoever wins earns the right to play him at Mises U. So we decided we would do this. And to our amazement, people showed up, right? It was a room full of people watching us play chess. I th and I thought, wow, these kids are even dorkier than I could have <laughs> dreamed. <laughs> so anyway, we, we played. And, and just don't get your hopes up. I mean, Walter and I are d pretty decent amateurs, but we're not grandmasters. So don't, you know, don't laugh at us if we you know, commit a blunder or whatever. But it was one of these sort of games where I, I, mean, I was clearly ahead. I mean, let's face it, I'm not just saying this. I was clearly ahead. I was ahead two pawns. Like a grandmaster would have resigned out of sheer embarrassment <laughs> by that point. But Walter tenaciously hung on because, after all, what does he do other than defend the undefendable? So he just <laughs> carried on doing that. And I had busted up all the, the pawns in front of his king, like I just, but I just couldn't stick the knife all the way in. And then I got into time trouble, and I just couldn't keep it up. And finally, one little error, and then bang, Walter got me. And so I realized that it's not just the defending the undefendable. I mean, this really is. He plays chess the way he fights the fight, right? He finds somebody. With, there's just one little deviation with somebody, and Walter's there, bang! You're not a libertarian. <laughs> so, so watch out. So anyway, so tonight, tonight we're going to revisit this, and uh, the one request we have, everybody, is no wagering. But otherwise, we would be really be glad if you sat here. But otherwise, if you would rather be drunk, that is fine, too. Right? We we're completely indifferent between these, these uh, options. All right, so anyway, so tonight... I, I, I beg your pardon? Indifference or not a libertarian? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, of course, yeah, maybe not an Austrian or something, right. Now, okay, now, be this, this being the, the evening session and it's optional, it means I can get away with saying things that I wouldn't say during the formal sessions, because remember, after all, that Austrian economics is dealing with, is, is descriptive rather than prescriptive. It's positive rather than normative. 
It's describing social phenomena, but it's not saying, therefore, you ought to do X or Y. So it, it's, it's not really right to be giving lectures on to, to talking entirely about libertarianism, because you could be, you know, as Walter Bloch points out repeatedly, you could be an Austrian economist and be a totalitarian socialist because you know that the free market yields social harmony, but you hate mankind, so you <laughs> want to impose socialism. That is possible. So I don't want to, for all you totalitarian socialists who applied to the Mises University, I don't want to offend you. But this being, <laughs> this being the after hours session, I can sort of get away with some of that. So in a little bit of what I say, and then later on uh, in the second half of what I'm going to do tonight, uh, it'll be a little bit more freewheeling libertarian stuff rather than strictly Austrian economics. But I, I want to really, in talking to you tonight, I want to inoculate you against uh, kind of a, a cult that's out there. There is a cult out there in the libertarian world, and I call it the cult of anti-Rothbard. And you will encounter this, I'm not going to name names, I'm not going to name places or institutions, because that's not what I'm here for. I just want to talk about ideas and a great man. But it's a cult of anti-Rothbard because you will encounter people who will be delighted to tell you all about the times they met Milton Friedman. Oh my goodness, I met Milton Friedman. I, I, I served him dinner. I sat next to him. I paid his bill, whatever the story is. <laughs> They're all thrilled to tell you their story about Milton Friedman. And you, you, you begin to realize that with some people, there are only three libertarians in the whole world. There was Hayek sometimes. <laughs> Hayek is okay sometimes, but let's never mention his actual economic contributions. So nothing from the 30s, no pure theory of capital, early 40s, none, none of that. None of, the, none of the stuff he won the Nobel Prize for. We don't want to talk about that, but we'll talk about other things about Hayek, Hayek sometimes. But basically, it's Milton Friedman and John Stossel, and that's the libertarian family. <laughs> now, that is not to take away from Milton Friedman or John Stossel. I mean, for example, it must have been very, very difficult for John Stossel being with ABC and trying to say anything remotely libertarian year after year. So I, I do respect that contribution. And likewise, we all know and, and perfectly well are happier to concede that Milton Friedman was quite good on, on some things and was a very good debater and could present uh, many of the ideas of a free society very, very effectively and could win converts. Nobody takes any of that aw away from him. But, it, but it's very odd to me that you would have someone as accomplished as Murray Rothbard who basically created the libertarian movement as we know it, who was known as Mr. Libertarian, and there is absolute silence about him. It's not that for every 100 times Milton Friedman is mentioned, Rothbard is mentioned only once. I started to say that to Lou once in an interview I did. I, I interviewed Lou on his own podcast once. I, and I, I stopped myself and I said, it's not for every 100 mentions of Friedman, it's one of Rothbard. It's for every 100, it's zero. For everything, like what is happening here? Well, I, I can't speculate as to what the motives are. I've got some thoughts and maybe Maybe at the end I'll, I'll share, share them with you, or especially if, you, if I have a few drinks tonight, I'll definitely share them. <laughs> but, all right, so but let's just think about the contributions of this guy, all right? And, and then you'll see how creepy this cult is. I mean, the, the fact that this guy's got all these contributions and you still pretend he doesn't exist, it, started, it's cre it creeps me out. Man, economy, and state. All right, so he writes Man, economy, and state. This thing, all right, so it's about, a, what, like a thousand pages, even if you don't include power and market. You should include power and market. Then it's on the order of 1,400 pages. You look at this thing closely, and you can see that Rothbard was deeply steeped in the literature, the economic literature. He, he was reading the mainstream journals. He was interacting with them. And in, in fact, it's interesting to note, I think Joe points this out in his introduction, that in fact, Rothbard very infrequently even uses the term Austrian economics in that book. And when he does use it, it's in quotation marks, it's so-called Austrian economics, because what he's trying to teach is just economics. He is trying to engage the profession and steer it in a particular direction. So he knows that he's not just some kid you know, who, who, who studied under Mises and learned some funny one line or something. He absorbed what he learned from Mises. He built on what he learned from Mises, and he also knew what the profession was saying. And this, this particular book plays a, a central role in the history of the modern Austrian school. And it's written in, in a beautiful, elegant style. It's written in the tone, with the tone of a scientist. It's not written as a polemic. And it, it's, it's something that you've, you feel a sense of accomplishment just reading it. 
Well, imagine what it was like writing it. Well, he wrote, he started writing it in his late 20s. And then it came out when he was 36 years old. Now, my, I'm turning 40 next week, and that's really depressing me very much. <laughs> so I insist this, this week, I want you to ask me repeatedly how old I am, so I can say 39 for the last few times. But I, I remember when I turned 36, I thought to myself, well, guess no big treatise for me. My, my 36th year has come and gone, and there was no... So All right, so if he stopped there, we would say, well, that's a pretty, pretty good job, right? Most people go through their lives not writing original pioneering economic treatises, right? <laughs> that's good. But he also, in that same year, published The Panic of 1819, which is more or less his doctoral dissertation from Columbia University. The Panic of 1819, a case study, a real study of an episode in U.S. history. And this book, if you look at the major historical journals, like the American Historical Review, all these historical journals, they all praise this book unreservedly. This is the definitive work. And it gave me great pleasure years ago in grad school, I was reading a book on Jacksonian America, and in the bibliographical essay it said, for the Panic of 1819, see Murray Rothbard's book, The Panic of 1819, which is likely to remain definitive. I thought, well, good, see? And it just goes to show, he, again, he, he, he interacted with the mainstream, he made real contributions that were appreciated and recognized. But that was not always so. 1963 came America's Great Depression. Now that was the same year of the Friedman and Schwartz book, the Monetary History of the, of the United States book. And that book got all the attention, but particularly the sections involving, the, the part involving the Great Depression got a lot of attention. Rothbard's book did not get that much attention. Yet today it's, it's in a fifth edition, and the fifth edition has a foreword by Paul Johnson, the, the, the British historian, sort of iconoclastic, sort of conservative British historian. And it was he who recognized the merits of this book when he wrote his, his I think it's a terrific book, uh, by Paul Johnson, Modern Times, The World from the 20s to the 80s. Now, I recommend, by the way, if you ever read that book, don't get his later edition, The World from the 20s to the 90s. Just, just get the modern times up through the 80s. Because in the 90s, then he starts supporting the, the uh, Iraq war, and it's, 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 yeah, it's terrible. Neocon, <laughs> terrible. But the rest of it's pretty good. And he recognized the importance of the Rothbard book. Basically, Rothbard was saying that uh, the Federal Reserve was to blame for the crash. And then subsequent economic policy by the government is to blame for why the depression itself went on so long. And he does this, he's doing, he's performing two revisionist tasks in this book. I mean, the, the, the better known one is that he's showing that Herbert Hoover was not actually just sitting back doing nothing like some doofus and while depression is washing over the country, he's just sitting there. If only that had been the case. To the contrary, he's intervening in all different areas as many of you know. That was an innovation. I mean, historically speaking. But secondly, to, say, to, to go back and trace out Federal Reserve policy in the 1920s and to identify <clears throat> inflation that was ongoing, this is also a contribution. Now, it's not, he wasn't the first one. I mean, you can find, <coughs> <coughs> there's, a, there's a book from, from 37 that, that does a little bit of analysis like this. And Lionel Robbins had an Austrian view of the Great Depression in 1934 called the Great Depression, but that was more looking at, at Europe than the United States. But still, to say that the Fed did it, but not for the reasons that Friedman says the Fed did it. It's not that the Fed just didn't create enough money. That, that is not the explanation. It was not, the, it was not the, the issue that the 1920s were fine and tranquil, but the problem was that <clears throat> once the downturn came, uh, the Fed didn't do enough to, to uh, increase the money supply when there was a collapse of the money supply by about one third. Rothbard won't have any of this. And he, goes and counters all this. Well, this is very important. And why is this important? Well, for one thing, it's important to tell the truth. But secondly, right now today, with the Austrian school getting all this attention, well, now naturally, what, what are people going to ask? What are people going to ask after the Austrian school is now getting some attention because our people disproportionately predicted the crisis? So the, people are going to ask, well, how, how did you know? And did you predict other things? Is this just some one-off fluke? Did you just happen to have a crystal ball or tea leaves or a deck of tarot cards for this case, but you were clueless on the other ones? Because of contributions like America's Great Depression, the Panic of 1819, we can see that there are Austrian explanations of these earlier things. And this is driving the establishment crazy, that now suddenly there is an interest in the Rothbardian view, not only of current events, but also of the Great Depression. I just made a video on my YouTube channel against David Frum, and those of you who are 
<clears throat> from Canada, you have a lot of explaining to do. All right, I mean, <laughs> take this take this guy back with you on your on your way out. But David Frum was so upset the other day. He said, "I can't believe how many conservatives now have moved from believing in Milton Friedman's view of the Great Depression over to." He can't bring himself to say Rothbard, so he said Mises' view of, of the Great Depression, and this just appalls him. Now, for one thing, if only most conservatives in America even knew who, you know, even Milton Friedman was, much less Murray Rothbard. <laughs> I mean, I think we are giving these people a little bit more credit than they have shown they deserve, I mean, with their Operation Desert Storm hats and whatever else. <laughs> but, but secondly, of course, the, the, the key thing is not just that it annoys him, but the fact that this is happening on a scale that it would come to the attention of a David Frum, that there are young people, uh, probably not in the conservative movement, naturally, but there are young people who are interested in these alternative explanations. Well, there wouldn't have been one if there hadn't been a Rothbard. Rothbard did that. And at the time, he got, uh, this was published to very little fanfare, and it never bothered him. Never bothered. He had a much smaller audience than, than his, the merits of this man demanded, and he just carried on. We have here a publication, a book called Economic Controversies, a collection of a lot of uh, Rothbard's scholarly articles. Well, that's great. I mean, these are, these are wonderful articles, and they're all great contributions, too. Uh, then I love the book of essays, Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Nature. In there, you'll find uh, two essays that are absolutely mind-blowing, in a book that's mind-blowing, but War, Peace, and the State is absolutely pioneering a libertarian theory of foreign policy, number one. And then Roderick has built on that. And then secondly, anatomy of the state. You never look at the world the same way again after you read those things. And these are just a couple of essays. Again, if, if somebody wrote just those essays, well, people have, have been spinning out thought based on that ever since he did those, that would be considered a contribution. He wrote a two-volume history of economic thought. So he knows pretty much what everybody who ever said anything about economics ever said. And he can evaluate it and critique it. I mean. You know, believe it or not, there are some people who would be impressed by that. You know, this is a pretty smart guy. Maybe I should talk about him. Not if you belong to the cult of anti-Rothbard. You are not to mention this man. Not to mention him, citizen. Look the other way. Then, as a spare time project, he, he writes a four-volume history of colonial America called Conceived in Liberty. Now, the Institute... Is, has, has now put that out as a single volume, which I think they did partly because they have a good sense of humor. Because if you look at the size of this thing, it's like they're looking to set the world record or, or something, you look at the size of this book. But you look at his, how conversant he is with the secondary literature of colonial America. It's unbelievable. The guy is an economist who has so mastered the Austrian school that by the time he was 36, he wrote a pioneering treatise a thousand pages long. But he also knows so much about colonial America, and then For a New Liberty. It's like the Libertarian Manifesto from the early 1970s. Uh, again, and here at the Mises Institute, you can actually listen to that for free in the audio, uh, on audiobook if you look at the Mises media section. The Ethics of Liberty, a work of philosophy, uh, extending the Lockean self-ownership principle and, and spinning out what its implications are. And then we have uh, smaller works, like, I like this, this one called Wall Street, Banks, and American Foreign Policy. This is a thing that he wrote for a, uh, an investment newsletter. It's like a 20,000 word essay for an investment newsletter. Maybe, maybe it had 200 subscribers. And it was never seen again until somebody found it in the archives and it was published. As, I, mean, I mean, this gem would have just been lost forever. Like, who knows how many things like this he wrote that we don't even know about. So he wrote zillions of articles on top of it. He wrote a book on ed education, the history of education, the mystery of banking, on how banking works. Of course, you guys read What Has Government Done to Our Money, which is a, a great classic. He wrote chapters in books. He edited the Libertarian Review. He edited Left and Right. He founded and edited the uh, Journal of Libertarian Studies. He founded and edited the Review of Austrian Economics. He was also a movie reviewer, wrote a zillion movie reviews. He kept up correspondence with a whole bunch of people. We've got the archives to prove it. Now, if you heard about a guy like this, pioneering in so many areas and extending libertarian insights into so many areas, would your first instinct be, I better not ever mention this man? <laughs> like, there's something deranged about this, right? I mean, like, there's something not right in the head. If you were to say, now this guy, nah, nah, <laughs> nah. I just want to talk about, uh, I don't want to mention names, but l lesser <laughs> figures, we'll say. 
Now, I, I think back to my own experiences with the guy, which were very limited. I, I only met him about four or five times, but, but, but memorable, obviously. You meet somebody like this. And, and again, uh, by the way, I should point out, obviously I'm not saying that anybody in this world is infallible or that you have to kneel down before his image and, and kiss it or pray to him or any of this. Uh, this is a ridiculous caricature. No one has ever said this. But the same thing with, with Mises or any great man. You should admire a great man. Right? It doesn't, doesn't mean every single word you have to agree with, but you should admire a great man. Just, just simple. But I remember, so I got to meet him at the Mises University program in, in 1993 and in 1994. And he came out, Mises U, 1993, he gave the opening night lecture. He gave the lecture that Bob Higgs gave the other night. And he was talking about a whole bunch of things, and he started off talking about the Panic of 1819. Now, I didn't know he had written a book on this. So he started off by saying, I'm the world's foremost expert on the Panic of 1819. And, and I thought, my gosh, boy, this guy's got a big head. And then he said, because he said, I'm the only one who's ever written a book on it. And he laughs, cackles, <laughs> and go, goes on. And so then the next time, I, I, then I met him at a, a conference later that year. And so, so Mises U, 1994, I'm standing there talking to some students, and Rothbard walks in, and he waves and says, hi, Tom. And I just thought, yeah, yeah, that was Murray Rothbard waving to me. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? So then at that event, actually, at one point we were having a conversation and, and I said, now, Professor Rothbard, I've always wanted to ask you. And he said, oh, call me Murray. I, you know, I just don't think I can. Like, I mean, thanks. I appreciate that. But I just, that's just not going to happen. But I remember Lou called me, Lou Rockwell, or uh, he emailed me in December 1994 and said, because Murray maintained two residences. He was out in, uh, in Las Vegas. See, I can call him Murray now that he's gone, because I don't feel so intimidated anymore. But out in Las Vegas, he had a place. And then in New York, he kept his apartment. So he was going to be in New York uh, over the holidays. And, uh, and Lou said, Murray would like to get together with you. Here's his number. Give him a call. And I thought, and it's kind of like how you feel like the first time you I, I'm sure I'm the only guy who's ever done this, but the first time you call up a girl on a date, like you write out the thing that you're gonna say or whatever, because like, <laughs> what if I draw a blank? <laughs> this would be a disaster. So I did that. But of course with Rothbard, like he, of course he would fill in all the blanks, right? You know, da, 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 gra like, I'm very glad to talk to you. But of course that was not to be. I mean, I did talk to him on the phone, but, but then, uh, then he passed away in, in January of, of 95. Now, I think back though about things that he, sort of taught me. And it's not just the stuff that I could learn reading in the books. It's also about how to live as a human being and how to be a scholar. And one of the things that everybody concedes about him, even the people who can't bring themselves to mention his name, if they did mention his name, they would never claim that he was arrogant. No one ever said that. They'd say other things about him. They would never say he was arrogant because everybody would know that's a lie. I mean, Rothbard was so interested. He was convinced that there were the world was just such a fascinating place. There were things to be learned everywhere. And people's brains were full of nuggets that maybe he could, he could e extract somehow. He could learn from everybody. And so, you know, you would be some dumb student. And, well, present company accepted, you understand? But, you know, you'd just be some kid, right? And he would be, he would listen to you respectfully. You know, none of this air of, you know, I'm Murray Rothbard. How dare you? You're not even worthy to walk on my ground or whatever. I mean, none of this stuff. He would be, you know, and then he would encourage people. And, and, and you know, if, if he saw any glimmer of interest in anything, he would encourage it. He would build people up. I mean, Walter carries on that tradition today with his students. If he sees any inkling of, of literacy at all among people, he says, you know, man, you've got to, you, know, you might be the next Mises. Well, he doesn't quite, <laughs> doesn't quite do that. But the point is he encouraged it. And that was how, that was how Rothbard was. I, I remember in particular, so, all right, so there I am, 1994. Uh, it's, the, it's an event that the Mises Institute is putting on commemorating the 100th anniversary of the birth of Henry Hazlitt. They had an event in New York City. Now, I was, I was living in New York City at that time for grad school. So I went. This is incredible. I just get on the subway and I go to a Mises event. Unbelievable. And I sit down. And then late, later in the program, who walks in but Rothbard? And he sits right next to me. So I thought, geez, this is just getting better and better all the time. So then he's sitting there listening, and he'll make little side comments during people's talks, you know, da, 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 which is sort of like what David Gordon does today, <laughs> except you could repeat to your mother the things that uh, Rothbard said. <laughs> but I, I specifically recall, I mean, just how, what a genuine, regular guy he was. Like, here's a guy who had written 
done theoretical work on the subject of punishment and proportionality. You commit a crime, what is the appropriate punishment for that crime? He's super, super sophisticated stuff. And then there he is at this Hazlitt event, and he, this was right around the time that Jeffrey Dahmer uh, was in the news. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer was the, some of you guys are too young to know this maybe, but he was a serial killer who ate his victims. And like there would be body parts in the refrigerator, it was horrible. And he was killed in prison. The other prisoner just said, look, you know, we're pretty rotten, but that, like you just can't <laughs> do that. And so Rothbard leaned over to me at one point and said, oh, by the way, did you hear about Jeffrey Dahmer? They got him! <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's a regular guy, it's a regular guy. But another aspect of this lack of arrogance is that he, I heard this rumor about him that he would correspond with you even if you were just some schmo. You wrote him a letter, he would write back to you. Where he found the time, I don't know. But he would write back to you, if you, even if you're some schmo. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna test out this theory. I'm some schmo. <laughs> Let's see if he writes to me. So I wrote, actually, I wrote to him because I had read somewhere about this pamphlet by Robert Lefebvre about the transformation of the American right and the, and the evolution of US foreign policy during the Cold War. And I thought, this would be great. I would love to get this, but where in the world would I find a pamphlet from like 1964? So I wrote to Roth, all right, let's see if uh, this guy's gonna write back. Not only did he write back to me, he sent me two copies of the pamphlet. <laughs> and so in our anthology I did with a, a friend of mine on the left, which you can find in the bookstore here, We Who Dared to Say No to War, we reproduced this pamphlet. So it now sees the light of day, it, it now ha it will be immortal. And it's great, it's because Rothbard wrote back to me. And I probably wouldn't have written back to him if, if, he had been, if, if, if it had been reversed, I'm too busy. How could I do it? And yet he did a simple little thing. He was not discouraged, as I said, by the size of his audience. Now, he should have had a gigantic audience. I mean, this is, a, again, a guy with one-tenth of these accomplishments could retire with pride. And yet, this was an age before the internet, and this was an age of, of um, even more statist outlook than, than uh, we have now, because at least now we have more people who have come out, more of the remnant is visible because of Ron Paul. And yet, this didn't bother him. He just, it, it didn't occur to him, well, if, if I keep writing these books, maybe not that many people will read them. He couldn't have known that there'd be a day like today when, I don't know, a gazillion people can read his stuff for free all over the world any time of day or night. And they want to because they realize, well, this, this guy who's been kept from me, no wonder he's been kept from me. He, like, there seems to be some rule in the world that the most awesome things are always smashed and, and criticized by the bad guys. Well, this guy is like the awesomest of the awesome. And now there's this, if there was an attempt to try to remove him, to erase him from history, hoping that the young people wouldn't discover him, it has failed abysmally. Everybody wants to be a Rothbardian. I mean, what is the coolest libertarian shirt there is? It's the enemy of the state shirt. Which, by the way, the Institute has now made in a, uh, in a different kind of style so that you don't have that sort of plastic white Rothbard head on a black shirt on a summer day, so it's a little easier to wear. So buy a second copy of that shirt. Get a second, <laughs> second one. So that, that's one thing that, that, that I liked. Uh, he also felt that he could, when I say that he could learn from everyone, I don't just mean that he thought everybody had uh, some nugget of knowledge, because probably that's not really true. But, I also, but what I also mean is, <laughs> even if somebody might disagree with him on something important, well, that doesn't mean, well, this guy disagrees with me on something, on something important, so he's probably a horrible person who should never be listened to or talked to. And yet there are people in the libertarian movement today who will treat you like this. They think you're wrong on two or three things. You are like an unperson. That was not Rothbard's view at all. There's just too much for me to learn from people. So he was perfectly willing to learn from people on the left. So what? So what? The, you know, people, people have insights. And these insights are not evenly distributed. And I've got to find them. And, and find them he did. But I think the thing that you learn the most from the cult of anti-Rothbard, though, is that you will have enemies. If you, are, if you take any position whatsoever in public life, it is absolutely unavoidable that you will have enemies. Now, I thought that I would be exempt from this. When I, when I wrote, uh, I, know, I know it sounds stupid and naive, but I thought when I wrote uh, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, I, I honest to goodness, the absolute truth, I thought to myself, well, people might not agree with me, but as long as I put forth my views sincerely and as persuasively as I can, then they at least have to respect me. <laughs> 
<laughs> so just, if, in case you were thinking that, that, that just, that's just not gonna happen. So, but particularly, think of it this way. If Rothbard had enemies among libertarians, what hope is there for the rest of us? You just have to accept it. You have to just live with it and move on and don't dwell on it. Don't spend, don't spend your life bitter dwelling on every angry blog comment or whatever. I mean, just don't do it. Rothbard wouldn't have done that. He spent his life in laughter, laughter, cackling laughter. That's what you should do. And I say this as somebody who initially, when I started getting attacked, that is what I, I had to go, oh my gosh, I got all this damage control to do. You know what? My, I sleep so wonderfully and soundly at night, not caring anymore. <laughs> so ultimately then, what I am recommending to you in this first half of my remarks tonight is, uh, is to resist the cult. Now, as I say, you're going to encounter this everywhere. Not everywhere, but in big influential places. No mention of this man. I don't care that you disagreed with some strategic decision he made 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I don't care. How unbelievably, disgustingly petty would you have to be to say, well, gee, I, I don't know. He shouldn't have allied with that small group of seven leftists because he was desperate and there was no libertarian presence anywhere in the world. So therefore, today, I should never talk. You know, a guy who writes what? I don't know, 20 million words? You're, you're going to put all that aside? I don't believe that's the real reason. They'll come up with all these phony baloney reasons. I, I am convinced the real reason, at least a good 80% of it, is just is sheer envy. And you may be skeptical of this explanation. And, and I would have been 10 or 15 years ago, too. I would have been skeptical. But as I've grown older and I, as I've observed people, I see that envy plays a much bigger role in the world than I ever dreamed. And there are a lot of people in the libertarian world who have not been as successful as Murray Rothbard. Like everybody, for example. <laughs> but some of us are at peace with that. Some of us say, he's a great man. I'm not a great man, but I'm at peace with that. I'm doing what I can w with the talents that I've been given. And that's all you can ask of yourself. But there are some people who feel like they can build themselves up only by tearing other people down. And in this case, erasing them from existence. Well, I would say to you, don't let them get away with this. In fact, to the contrary, there is now a posit we are positively compelled to mention him, to break through this blackout and give this man his due, not simply because one man deserves it as a matter of justice, but because the cause of freedom will be all the more readily pursued if the ideas of Rothbard are shining through. Join me against the cult, everybody. Thank you very much.